thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very, uh, very much for having me here today. Uh, this this opportunity is really, really special for me. Uh, I want you all to know how much your company, how much uh, these uh, this technology, these uh, this this equipment has become part of my life, has become part of uh, my rehab. Uh, you know when you are so close to death. You are a stone's throw away from death, and you beat death. Well, you get a second chance at rebuilding yourself. When you rebuild yourself, the the, the people, the uh, the equipment uh, that you rebuild yourself with really becomes a second part of you. It becomes uh, it becomes part of your DNA. And so uh, today, I want to share with you a little bit of that journey. I want to share with you this nightmare. But it's a nightmare with a happy ending because I'm here. And, uh, <laughs> and um, so before we start with this story slash nightmare, um, let me introduce a little bit the main character in the story. That, that's me. I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> you were expecting somebody else. It's, it's, it's me. Um, I, was, uh, I was born in Brazil. A while back, um, I have two brothers, and uh, later on I had two stepbrothers, so five boys growing up. That itself is a unique experience. And um, toured around the world. My, my dad was in international business and uh, moved from Indianapolis to Philadelphia, to Denmark, to Italy, Belgium, uh, New York, Michigan. So uh, definitely um, saw a lot of the world and picked up four languages along the way. And um, sooner or later, I made my way to uh, Oakland University, uh, where I got a scholarship to play basketball, Division I. And I met my wife. So most of you would say, okay, well, after living in all those places, well, how do you end up in Michigan? Well, it's her fault. <laughs> <laughs> she's, uh, she's from Battle Creek, so not too far away. And um, yeah, we met uh, 19 years ago. And after playing basketball and a little bit of studying here and there, <laughs> um, I got a professional contract uh, to play uh, to play in Italy, and uh, played 15 years professional in Italy and Belgium. And um, after these uh, 15 years of uh, professional basketball, it was uh, time, like my wife always says, to get a real job. <laughs> and uh, so the transition from basketball to a real job, um, I started a little company with two of my buddies from high school. And uh, we uh, we invented the world's no I'm sorry we didn't invent I'm not, I'm not that smart we we marketed the world's first automated video production system so we can live stream a basketball game 100 percent automatically there's no operator there's no cameraman it's fully functional uh, automated technology and we started in 2012 and we sold it in 2015 to a big group of investors in New York. And we opened offices in New York, and I started traveling back and forth from the European market to our new New York offices. And so the story picks up on March 22nd, 2016, as I'm about to board a flight to go from Brussels, Belgium, back to New York to uh, to attend a, a board meeting for um, for Team Belgium, the little company that we started. I think. From the explosion to when you come to your senses again, those two to three seconds is is unreal. It's hell. You hear the screams. That's an arm. That's a leg. You can see that. And it's the smell. Disgusting. As 38-year-old Sebastian Bell lay gravely injured, these images of him were already circulating on the internet, becoming symbols of the Brussels airport terrorist attack. You feel death creeping on you. From knee down, you don't feel anything anymore. And then it goes up to your thighs. And you're thinking, okay, this is going up. If it's my heart, I'm done. 4,000 miles away from Bellin's home in Battle Creek, Michigan, 
His wife, Sarah, had just woken up when she received a text from a friend. We're thinking of you, we're here for you, Sarah. We love you. And I thought, that's a strange message. But then I saw the photo. I screamed. I woke the girls up from my screaming. It was panic and terror, and I saw that he was trying to look up. As the former college and pro basketball player Lake Leader, news organizations reported that the deadly blasts were coordinated suicide bombings at Brussels Airport and a train station. ISIS later claimed responsibility. I put bullets in the bomb. I got shot via the bomb into my head. My head was just sticking out. You know, I just had like bones and flesh. I straightened out my knee, but my foot stayed on the other side on the ground. I was really concerned about losing my leg. It wasn't detached, but I thought it was at first because I couldn't feel anything. That's when somebody came and pulled me away from that spot to behind some pillars where that photo was taken. So when he pulled me, I was actually hanging on to my leg, feeling like I didn't want to lose it. What I realized is that there was people coming to help and then leaving because everyone thought this would be a quick explosion. My game plan was every time they come back, tell them what you want them to do. Bellin was rapidly losing blood. He desperately needed medical help, but he couldn't move. When your blood pressure goes down, you start sweating. And I, I was sweating nonstop. So I knew that you know, time was clicking. And so I just kind of bullied my way <laughs> to say, no, I'm out of here. You know, and I was, I was threatening people. I was like, if I stay here, I die, it's unconscious. In order to survive, Bellin says he had to be mobile. He convinced a young airport worker to help his six foot nine frame onto a luggage truck and move him to the front of the terminal. Like in the game, you know, you're down. How are you going to get up to that 20, that 20 point gap when you've got to find ways to chip away at it? And I was chipping away. Everything I could use, I was chipping away. I, I overcoming the situation that everything around me told me, you know, this, you know I can make it. Bellin had lost 50% of his blood and was rushed to the hospital and taken into surgery. Four days later, his wife Sarah arrived in Brussels. I couldn't wait to get in there and put my arms around him and hug him and just hold him. Happy that he was alive and he made it. On May 1st, Bellin was reunited with daughters Cecilia and Vanessa. You want to shield them from the reality. You know, you want your kids to stay innocent and be able to grow without the worries that sometimes we face. In these circumstances, it's very hard, you know, to keep that reality from them. They got too much weight on that right way. After six surgeries and three months in the hospital, Bellin returned to the United States on June 9th. Therapists at University Hospital at the University of Michigan are helping him learn to walk again. Those 50 yards, not even away from a major bomb blast that took out, you know, half of the airport. And yet I still have my both my legs. So I choose to look at it as, you know, they're not looking too good with the pretty strong legs. My tibia was multifragmented. So basically it means that the bone blew up. They drilled a nail into my tibia. So they had to put a pin into my femur and reconnect it with a nail to my to my hip socket. There was no fracture here, it was just a hole straight to the bone. They took skin from here and closed the two major wounds. Bellin played basketball at Marist College and Oakland University. Then overseas as a pro for 15 years. Can you have a few practice shots? Yeah, sure. I owe so much to basketball. It's given me a skill set to be able to survive, you know, a terrorist attack because I, I really did use a lot of the things that I learned in basketball or my athletic side to survive it. Like what? Not panicking, you know, staying calm under pressure. That competitive nature wanted me to beat the situation. <laughs> Bellin said it was his daughters who gave him the will to survive. How the girls doing? They're doing great. Yeah. They're so happy that he's back here. But it was hard for them, especially our youngest. She would cry for him every night. I don't want your They were my motivation. And to be able to overcome that, we need some motivation behind that. And um, 
just just thinking about the moment. It's it's tough. I owe a lot to them because it's your kids, you don't want them to grow up without a dad. It's, um, I, without them knowing, I owe, I owe them a lot. All right. So, uh, again, not the easiest, not the easiest of images to see. But um, through this experience, there are certainly a lot of positives and so many um, great lessons to learn from. And um, how do you bounce back from something like this? How do you rebuild yourself? How do you come back even stronger than before with a new perspective on life? How do you recycle a negative into a positive? These are all questions that we all ask ourselves. All of us have problems, and hopefully not to this magnitude. But we certainly all have problems in life. And I think that the experience has taught me, I think, four main themes, four main categories. The first one being the team. You gotta build your team. I think that's when you have such traumatic experience of injuries. I needed 11 surgeries. I have one more scheduled for the 6th of November. When you have so many visions, like dead people around you, you see things that are, your mind has a hard time comprehending. If you try to rebuild everything at once, it's usually much harder. So, the cliche is very true, step by step. And literally, this became a step by step experience. How to take that step again. And so I realized I'm not going to be able to do this all on my own. I need some great people around me. I need some great technologies around this, some methods. I started looking everywhere, searching, asking questions. How can I walk again? Because you should know that days after the attacks, I couldn't be operated on for three days. My injuries were so severe, the swelling, the, the, the trauma was so severe that doctors couldn't do anything to me for three days. So for three days, I lay in bed, not knowing whether I was going to be amputated, whether I was going to spend the rest of my life in a wheelchair, whether I was ever going to come close again to walking, to feeling, to chasing after my food. So those three days, I put together a game plan. And the first part of that game plan was my team. So who are these knuckleheads right here? <laughs> these knuckleheads are my surgeons. And I realized that they're probably pretty good guys to have on your team, because they got a lot to fix. And these two guys are Greeks, Professor Kulalis and Teo. Now the amazing thing about my team, and I'm pointing out these two individuals, is that it takes 14 years to be an orthopedic surgeon, 14. And Professor Kulalis, I mean, he's, he had been at, just at that hospital in, in Erasmus for 30 years. He invented the external fixator, which was the first apparatus they put on him, which was my legs were so shattered that they had to prick a metal bar with pins sticking into my legs to kind of mobilize and stabilize the bone. He invented it. He's the inventor of the external facing. But this is a man with such humbleness, with absolutely no ego, that he actually listened to Teo, who's a year, he's only a year 13. He's not even a real surgeon yet. I used to tell him that every day. <laughs> You're not even a real surgeon yet. Okay, are you sure this is gonna work? <laughs> and so we chose a very, very, let's say, it wasn't shaky, but there were some, there were some uncertainties about the, the plan of attack we, we, we chose. Because when you have open wounds, bacteria can get inside the open wounds without you even knowing. And if bacteria gets inside, then you go put metal inside, and the bacteria gets on the metal, so 
that's really not good because the body has no way to get rid of that bacteria it's because the blood the blood flow does not go through the blood. It's only the blood. And so we talked for hours and hours, and we, we told ourselves, listen, let's, let's do this. We can do this. And we found all the ways. We really became friends. We, we created a team. That was the first piece of the team. And they said, okay, well, if we do this, you know, your rehab is going to be much more expensive because you're going to have to, you're not going to be able to put support on the body, the body parts that we're going to fix. An external fixator keeps the bones together, and so you can put pressure on, on it. But I didn't want an external fixator. I wanted, the, I wanted to keep all my original bones. I didn't want any prosthetics or anything like that. But with metal inside, it's much more fragile. But we needed to come up with a rehab machine that was able to sustain this goal. And that's where you guys come in. <laughs> so I researched and researched and researched, and I found this little company in Michigan. And I was like, wait, Michigan? Ann Arbor? No one's, I never even heard of you guys. And so we looked and said, okay, well, you don't have to put a lot of pressure on your legs. You can go little by little, step by step. And so I told this, I remember Kualis coming into the, to, to the room one day and saying, listen, um, and I told him, I, I found it, I found the machine, this is gonna work. And he's like, wait, what are you talking about? He's like, you're gonna go back to the States to do rehab? I said, yeah, the University of Michigan has one of those. I said, oh. He said, okay, so you're going to leave us. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm going to leave you. But I'll be back. And so we started. We took a risk, and we, um, we started that journey. And my goal was to walk again as a birthday present to my daughter. The, attack, the attacks happened on March 27th, and my daughter's birthday is July 27th. And they told me after the fourth surgery that I probably wouldn't be able to walk again for a year and a half. And I walked for four months. So as she came down, yeah, as she came down, as she came down the stairs on July 27th, I was sitting at the table. She looked at me kind of puzzled. And I got up and walked and I gave her a big hug. I said, happy birthday. And so when I told you before, that new step has really become part of my DNA. It really has. Because if you've noticed, that's actually me that did it. I'm up to 18 minutes and 27 seconds, six laps, on level seven. That's my that's my rehab every single day. I'm gonna improve that, okay? But this is a good start, it's a good start. And so once you create your team, once you create your team, how do you maximize your team? You got your surgeons, you got new step. Well, how do you put that all together? How do you get the most out of your team? First of all, I believe that fear is an illusion. See, there's a big danger, there's a big difference between danger and fear. Fear, danger is a car can match at full speed. That's dangerous. You move out of the way, you're gonna get hit by a car. But fear is getting up in the morning thinking you're gonna get hit by a car. The only place fear exists is in your mind. You actually have power over fear. And so I had my team, and I was fearless. I realized that it was an illusion. I realize that in my mind, that emotion that we often all feel has no place. I have power over it. So I was fearless. This is the arena where I won five championships. I was a captain of this team for five years. But I said, you know what, I'm gonna go back in my wheelchair and I'm gonna do the tip-off. Because I know that one day I'm gonna go back there and I'm gonna be walking again. And so once you eliminate that fear from your mind, once you realize it's an illusion, it frees you. It frees you in incredible ways. How many of us go to work 
with fear? How many of us raise our kids with fear? How many of us are colleagues with fear? It hasn't even happened yet, but you're already imagining the fear gripping you or the failure. Think of how much energy that saps from your potential every day. And so without that fear, I was able to start focusing. And that's the third thing, the focus. Your focus becomes so much more clear. So to take it back to March 22nd, when I was lying on that airport floor, seconds after the second bomb went off, there's a dead woman next to me. And there's body parts all around me. That fear didn't grip me. I was not dying. I had survived. That fear did not control. And so all of a sudden, since I had this illusion erased from myself, I started seeing opportunities around me. So a scarf that was to my right became a tourniquet for me to be able to stop the flow of blood. A suitcase to my left became a way for me to elevate my legs. A baggage cart in the distance became a way for me to be mobile again. I had legs that could push me around. How many of us have that fear that blinds us from all the opportunities that exist around us every day in our lives? Life had put those opportunities in front of me in order to survive. Had I had that illusion in my mind, had fear gripped me the whole time, I might have had to see that. And how many of us fail to see the opportunities that life puts in front of us? But once you have that focus, once you have that energy channeled to your goals, well, what are you going to focus on? And that comes down to the fourth theme. Well, the fourth theme is the quality versus quantity. See, I think we're a society that focuses so much more, more and more on quantity. It's all about the numbers. It's all about how much. And there's a big difference between wants and needs. See, your needs, everybody wants to be a champion, but what do you need to be a champion? It's two distinctly different things. I think your needs, your true needs, is the quality of your life. Your wants is the quantity. You see, once when you when you're this close to death, when death is literally knocking on your door, you don't see the things you see flash before your eyes. Have nothing to do with quantity. Nothing at all. You don't think about the house or the bank account. You don't think about any of those things. You think about the quality. You think about the experiences, your family, the trips, the dinners. Those are the things that you share that mean something. That becomes your inspiration. That's what gets you out of that mess. So when you get out of that mess, well, your focus becomes exactly what got you out of that mess. And you start focusing more and more on that. It's like a cup of water. You know, when you're really, really, really thirsty, you sit there and think, hmm, I need about four glasses of water. No, just think, I'm thirsty, I need water. You don't quantify your needs. Needs are very hard to quantify. Wants are very easy to quantify. And so I always raise a flag in my mind when I can quantify something. And I love to use the imagery of suitcases. We, we all have suitcases. We all have bags. And I tell my daughters every day, you know, when they pack, pack their bags to go to school, what are you putting in your backpack? You see a lot of people in life stuffing their bags with quantity. They have that fear. So what eases that fear? Oh, I have a lot. Because if I have a lot, I'm going to feel good. And so they stuff their bags with quantity, quantity, quantity. 
Well, by definition, if you stuff your bag with quantity, you can very heavy. And so you see people walking through life with those heavy backpacks, with those heavy bags. And all of a sudden, you see somebody zooming by them with a smile on their face. They're carrying a load that doesn't even seem like there's anything in it. Because they're stuffing it with quality. How much does love weigh? How much does friendship weigh? Tolerance. Those things don't weigh anything. And so the more you put those in the bags, the lighter and lighter your bags become. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things I've found. That the more quality you put in your bags, the quantity comes by itself. It's trying to catch up. And so I'll leave you with one anecdote. It's a true story. It happened the night before the attacks. The night before the attacks, I was in Paris all day. And I just negotiated a four-year contract with the entire French basketball team. If you've ever negotiated with French people, it's a pretty hard talk thing to do. But we signed and agreed to a four-year 820,000 euro contract per year for our little company in Belgium. We made it. The little company that had over 3 million euros in revenue over the next few years, we made it. And so I took the train, the last train, from Paris back to Brussels that night. I was tired. And what should have been a celebration was just like, oh, I must really fight tonight. And I gave my buddy who calls me, a childhood friend. His, his wife works with my wife at the International School of Belgium. My wife's a teacher. They co-teach together. He's Belgian, so his English is not always the best, but you know we, we really have a close friendship. And he, he calls me. He says, listen, I, I know you're leaving tomorrow. You sent me a text. I haven't seen you some time. Why don't you come out to dinner with us? I said, no, no, I'm tired. I won't go home. I'm leaving, I'm leaving early tomorrow morning. I hang up on him. And he calls me back a second time. He says, listen, just, just come out for an hour. You, you need to eat. Says, no, I'm just not going to be on the field of and I'll, I'll get something at the airport and I'll hang up on him a second time. Calls back a third time. He's like, listen, Kara really wants to see you too. It's not really me who wants to see you, it's Kara. <laughs> <laughs> she wants news about your wife, about Sarah. I said, no, but anyways, come on, I'm going to be bad company. I just, I just want to go home. And I hung up on him. He calls back a fourth time. Well, listen, man, I love you. Come on, I haven't seen you in a long time. You need to eat. All right, fine. And I meet him at this little Italian restaurant that we love in downtown Brussels. This little Italian restaurant is owned by an Italian guy and his wife is Spanish. And they make the most amazing food. It's a little restaurant, seven tables. And they, they, they're in the back in the kitchen, arguing all night long. But their <laughs> food is amazing. <laughs> And we get to the restaurant and I order my favorite dish, which is pasta carbonara. And he brings me the plate, pasta carbonara, and I, I didn't eat anything all day. I wolfed it down two seconds. By the time he comes back out, my plate's already finished. I said, wait, that wasn't enough. I said, listen, your quality is amazing, but your quantity it means a serious work. <laughs> and, and, and he gets offended. He gets offended and he goes into the back of the kitchen. And makes me a double portion of pasta carbonara. This one was humongous. And he brings me back out. And a bunch of twists. And I eat the whole thing. Everything. Because I put the plate back on the shelf. And I go home that night. And the next morning I go to the airport and I lose one leg. And I lose 50% of my blood during the attack. But I never passed out a single time. Never once. And so for the next few days after the hospital, next few weeks, the doctors literally took blood samples every other day. They could not understand how a guy this this big losing that much blood never passed out. And so I was like, listen, after a while I had enough. 
Because I've lost enough blood. Let's get some of that blood in there. <laughs> and no, no, we, we want to test. We don't understand. They tested all my, my supplements. Everything I take, they, they tested. They couldn't understand. Until I told them about the pasta coming up. And they go, aha! That's the reason why. I said, wait, I'm alive because of pasta? <laughs> Because that's really going to change the story. <laughs> I told my daughters I'm big and strong, you know, I'm a tough guy. But no, no, it's the pasta. Explain yourself. Well, your blood sugar index was so high, your glycemic index was so high, that you were able to sustain the dramatic blood loss and trauma that your body experienced. So that's the only reason. I said, yes, we've never, if it wasn't for those three plates, the three portions of pasta carbonara, we wouldn't be here. So what's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is never say no to a second or third portion of pasta carbonara. <laughs> but what's really behind that story? Why am I really alive today? Because I have so much quality in my life, so much love. And I have a friend who I hung up on four times. And he called me back every single time. I'm alive today not because of the quantity of pasta that I ate, but of the quality that I had in my life. And so I urge you, I urge you, if there's one thing you take away, is to focus on the quality you have in your life. Picture yourself every morning packing your bags, going to work, dropping your kids off at school, going on vacation. Whatever it is, picture what you're packing in your bag. If you pack it with quantity, it's going to be heavy. If you pack it with quality, you won't feel a thing. And you see yourself starting moving through life and even overcoming death. So again, for me, this is extremely, extremely special because I have found quality, I have found a team, I have found all of these things in my life that have allowed me to walk again, to train for marathons, to, to tackle life in all the ways I never thought possible. To the point where I look back and what happened to me was a gift. It truly is a gift because it made me realize how important it is to focus on the quality, to create the team. And so, this is a thank you to you all who helped make that quality every single day. It's important you should know that that quality serves many people in many ways. And it's a real team that you have here. So, I'm not going to take it any more of your time, but this is truly a thank you to you all for this amazing company, for what you do every day. You know, it's important for you to know that you do make a difference in people's lives. And you do make a difference in the quality of people's lives. And so sometimes when you have those tough moments, just remember that, you know, one of the reasons why I'm walking around today and why I have a smile on my face. And sometimes life is just that simple. You know, just keep smiling, keep focusing on the positives, on the quality that you have, and the things you can help them. Thank you. Person for a new sketch. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> we can talk. <laughs> 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 
I think I think it's a plan. I think it's I think it's in the future. It's in the cards. So you mentioned that uh, you're going to be you're training or training for a marathon already. Yeah. Yeah. So so um, I became a little bit of a in a very humble way a symbol of the Brussels tracks. And so I partnered with the city of Brussels to say, okay, um, what better story or message is there that less than two years after the attacks, the guy that almost lost his legs is running the Brussels Marathon. And so they came to me and asked. I said, okay, well, I'm really gonna need a team here. <laughs> and uh, I still don't feel anything in my left foot. So I've lost all feeling in, in, in my left foot. But um, yeah, I, I got a good team around. And uh, I got a new set machine at my house, so uh, I'm good to go. And uh, I think that's the plan: is little by little to partner with uh, with companies, with uh, with groups, with associations to uh, to build a story. And again, always recycle. You know, when negatives happen in your life, try to recycle it into the positive. The opportunities are there to do it. You just got to be able to look at it and see it in a positive way. Which is what I'm doing. Raise your hand if you've run a marathon. That's more support for you. Here's the All right. <laughs> I want all your email addresses. <laughs> I want your emails, your phone numbers, everything. And there's a six hour time difference with Belgium. So sometimes you might get a call in the middle of the night. That's me. <laughs> Did you start on the 2XR? Uh, no, I started on uh, another one. Uh, at the University of Michigan, and uh, they actually started me. I think I remember the first time I went down there, I was in a wheelchair, and of course, you know, the, the chair of swivels. And so, um, you know, it was they, they really wanted to be cautious. And I remember doing it for five minutes the first time, five minutes on level like one or zero, carrying the money. And I just I remember doing it, and I remember little by little asking. To be able to come down on the weekend, they, they gave me the key so I could come down on the weekends myself and open up the rehab and, 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 and get on the new stuff. So by the time where, you know, like I said, I, I only stayed at the University of Michigan for three weeks only because the project was so remarkable that after three weeks, I actually, I, you know, with, with Walker and with, with crutches, um, they let me go. They, you're paying like, you know what, go home. <laughs> I said, I'll go home. And then I went to Bronson. And the reason why I went to Bronson in Battle Creek was they also had new set machines. So I put some good mileage on the new set machines at U of M and at Bronson. Was it the same model? Or? No, it was an old one. We got to do something about that. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, Brian has a question. Well, what was one of your companies? What's that? Key Motion. K E E K E E M O T I O N. And uh, I sold, I, I no longer, you know, after, after something like this happens, you're, like I said, your priority changes a little bit. And uh, so I, it's, it's an amazing little company, but we sold it to um, David Blitzer, who owns the 76ers, and uh, the New Jersey Devils. And uh, yeah, I left my last day was June 30th. Of this year. Okay. On to the next one. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, have you been on the newer version? Yeah, I have one of those at my house. What are, you, what are your thoughts on the, the difference in using it? Yeah, well, I, I, love, I love the versatility of it. I don't use the hand thing. Mm -hmm. Because I really just focus on on the on the legs. That, that's really what I need. Um, but I, you know, this is how I do. I, I love how you can adapt your workouts to your needs. So you know, you start with one lap, you time it, you go with two, you go up a level. Like there's a lot of alternatives you can do. While it's it's unique, it's a differentiator. Because when I describe a new step, I say, well, it's a cross between an elliptical. Uh, a seated bike and a stairmaster, you know, and there's nothing else really on the market like that. And and again, you know, I I played professional basketball for 15 years, and so one of the things that I think would be really beneficial is to have these in all fitness and professional sports teams, you know, which is I think a market for a new step that doesn't really that that 
could improve. And because I, I know that warming up, you know, games are so intense now at the, at the highest level that you just want to warm up your legs. You know, you don't need to start, you know, your arms or anything. Um, so for me, I think this is, yeah, this is, uh, this is perfect. This is what you want. Is, um, is yours custom to you, to how tall you are? Um, no, actually, I sit behind the chair. The reason I ask is, I, and it might just be the picture, but I swore it said seat position 17 on the picture that you had. And the, the, the XR only goes up to 15. I mean, it's disgusting. Should we go back? Can you take a sample of my back? Yeah, you go to the eighteen and you can do the bathroom like that. Yeah. 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 Did you ever did you ever think about oh uh, man like I don't know if I really want to play basketball because like the, the love for the game was, was cool yeah but coming from I, I played because I mean not professional basketball but coming from a person that did do injuries while I wasn't playing basketball just you know because love for the game that I probably never really want to play again how did you Pretty much focused on my well, was that was that even the thought was it? Yep. Yeah. Well, well, first of all, that's, that's a great question, and I think that when one door closes in life, other doors open. You know, and you have to just accept the fact that there's some things that the door closed. You know, and if you keep trying to open a door that's closed and locked, well, you're just going to waste your energy. On the other hand, you can focus on the three or four other doors that open, like new step. Like, there's, there's been tons of opportunities. Well, I think it's your life becomes much more, let's say, fluid if you just accept the fact that, okay, it's, uh, yeah, that's life, you know, and things happen. Um, but opportunities arise, doors open, and don't waste your time trying to open a door that's locked. If you don't have the key, you're just gonna be there a long time, you know? Um, and then there's, I mean, there's so many things looking back that uh, I remember one of the one of the amazing stories too is um, when there's when there's a huge uh, traumatic let's say uh, lots of injuries or or, 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 or deaths like like a bombing like that um, the emergency teams place um, they take you to a triage place and in the triage they rank you they rank you by um, seriousness of your injury okay. So, so uh, a, a green one, if they put a green sign on you, it means oh, it's a little scratch, you big baby. You know, don't, don't pay attention. And the yellow one means curious. You know? um, the red one is critical, first one in the, in, in the ambulance. The black one means dead. You know, I mean, you're gonna die, don't even waste your time on, on this person. And I, I got a red one, you know. So if I had been passed out, you know, if I had been, you see, a big 6'9 guy on, on a cart just passed out, I could have very easily gotten a, red, uh, a black one. So my point in answering your question is, I've had so many good things happen along the way. I've been able to survive and overcome so many things that if I start switching my focus back to, oh, life's not fair, man. I can't, I can't play basketball anymore. You know, I was, I was kind of good at it too. I could have become a coach. You know, I could have coached at OU. You know, I could have done this, I could have, yeah, but there's, that's, that would be neglecting all the positive things that have happened since then that I can build on. So it's really is, you know, when you're rebuilding yourself, focus on the good things that are already happening and not the ones that doors closed, it's locked. Forget it, you know, you know. I mean, you can still, still coach. <laughs> I, found, I found a niche. I'm gonna gir uh, coach girls basketball, U14. <laughs> I, I live with three girls now, so I got it down. I, mean, I went from five brothers to three girls. I, got it. I understand how they work. I think I'd be an amazing U14 girls coach. <laughs>
after that. Let us know how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I invite you. Oh, is that a question? Just about the process of that. Um, is that, I mean, did, did you research what happened to that? Was there yeah. some kind of, I'm just, how do you get over like a traumatic experience, personally? Like, was it trying to find out as much as you could on, on exactly how it happened? Or? Yeah, exactly right. That's a great question. That's exactly what I did. You know, knowledge is power. So the more we know about something, the less, e even the less the illusion of fear overcomes. Because a lot of things that we believe or we think are true, if you back it up with facts or knowledge, and you're like, no, oh, that's not true. You know, you can walk after four months. No, or you can do this, or there are machines out there that help you, or there, so facts and knowledge, research, does help you negate that illusion. And the more you have those facts and that research, the more you discover new opportunities. That's what research is. You know, find new ways of making it happen. And then I think you touched on the other really good point is that, you know, when you rebuild yourself, it takes a lot of energy. You know, I, I couldn't move from a hospital bed for three months. And to be a professional athlete, you know, and go from, I can't stand still for a minute, you know, to not being able to move from a hospital bed for three months, that's tough. So there's a lot of things to rebuild. There's a lot of things to, to conquer and overcome. And when you rebuild yourself, you need, you need energy. And I quickly saw that, well, what's the use of rebuilding yourself on revenge, hatred? You know that's that, that's not gonna that's gonna sap my energy. It's not going to give me energy. And so by focusing on the positives, on love, on the people around me, well, I became more. I, I was filled with energy, and I was like, I was like, let's do this. You know, I I come in like the doctor would come in at, in, in the hospital. And I'd be like doing pull ups in my bed. You know, and they're like, no, 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 don't do that. I'm like, no, I'm good. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it's just these kind of this this kind of energy energy where you don't get that if you're you don't get that if you focus on you know plus those terrorists they're dead you know they blew themselves up so if i'm mad at them i'm really wasting energy because they're not even around anymore you know and we can laugh about it but it's true you know that that door is definitely locked i mean they're not here you know so what's the point any other questions Thank everyone for coming, but more importantly, Sebastian, thanks for coming and reminding us of how important